<laughs> it's like, I feel like this is going to be our most buttoned up top line we've well, ever we're had. recording early in the day. My eyes work worse the earlier it is in the day. So I need yeah, to wear Austin, this right I, Austin woke up 10 minutes ago, actually. He's, uh, <laughs> we're recording at 1236. So everybody understands. He's not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, Sam, I'll do anything. Well, I appreciate it. Also, AJ, I had a good run this morning. So, you know, Philly, here we come. This is Top Line. Thank you for tuning in. This episode was brought to you by the Revenue Optimist community and Traction Complete. You can learn more, watch the latest episode and find the Revenue Optimist under resources on Traction Complete's homepage at tractioncomplete.com. Hello, everybody. (laughs) Hello from somewhere. We got a we got a two parter today, folks. It's top line. Sam Jacobs here with Asad and AJ. I have to take a trip in a little bit. So you're going to hear the first part of the episode with me and then the second part with Kevin Kinnearum. Is that right? I, I was wondering how you say the last name. The president of Clary. Let's just say that. President of Clary. Used to be chief revenue officer. And that's how I got, yeah. yeah. So that's how I got to know him. Um, how's everybody doing? Asad, how are you? I'm good. It's, uh, it's a good week. I productive week. I'm happy. I'm doing well. AJ? I'm doing all right. I missed the memo on wearing our glasses today. You all are looking very studious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I feel like this is going to be our most buttoned up top line we've well, ever we're had. we're recording early in the day. My eyes work worse the earlier it is in the day, so I need yeah, to wear Austin, this right I, Austin woke up 10 minutes ago, actually. He's, uh, <laughs> we're recording at 12.36, so everybody understands. <laughs> He's not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, Sam, I'll do anything. Well, I appreciate it. Also, AJ, I had a good run this morning. So, you know, Philly, here we come. Um, what I said, why don't we get started? Why don't you kick us off? Okay. So we have Kevin joining us later today, as you mentioned. He's the president of Clary. And Clary, most of our listeners would know Clary. They're a leader in the grow to market space. They provide this really comprehensive revenue platform and they've evolved from a really specific solution, which I think at the time was considered was considered revenue intelligence and was more of a RevOps type of solution to this end-to-end revenue platform. And in the go-to-market space, this has been playing out a lot. There are a lot of companies that were very specific, like Gong and Outreach, that have evolved somewhat recently into more comprehensive solutions. Collaborators have become competitors. And from the outside, it seems like either all of them realized that their original TAM calculations were off. And so to minimize churn, they need to provide a lot more value to the world. Um, or, or sorry, the TAM calculations were off, or this is a churn issue where we're just not providing enough value and we need more comprehensive solutions um, to be able to minimize churn in this world where customers are optimizing for profitable, efficient growth. This churn situation, we've touched on it a lot in the, in the podcast. Uh, there was some data highlighted by David Spitz a little while ago where he compared the public company NRRs between Q4 of 2022 and Q3 of uh, Q4 2023. And it was interesting. You saw Snowflake as being the company that has had the largest drop during that period. They've generally been the leaders from an NRR perspective. In Q4 2022, they were 158% NRR. They're now down 27% on that. Amplitude was 119%. They are down by 21%. Uh, Zoom Info. It was 104% in 2022 Q4. They're 87%. They're not far from the doom loop. And there were a lot of other companies that had similar numbers. Um, Then there was one last part to this, which was our friend Asha Matthews from Partnership Leaders. He's been tracking the number of C-level executives in various go-to-market roles. Obviously, the reason he's doing it is he's trying to show people that the partnership role is growing. But in doing so, he he ended up finding out something that I think is quite fascinating, which is that between Jan 1st of this year and March 1st of this year, 600 chief customer officers have left the role. And so... 
the question is, Sam, so far, much of this conversation around CS has been around structure and incentives and the people side of things. But maybe companies are just not providing enough value to justify the renewal or upsell and CS is the end point. So it gets blamed for everything. Do you think that companies instead need to look at this from a value being provided perspective? I think that so you're the the setup for the question is Clary, Gong, Outreach, all of these platforms that sit adjacent to or somewhere near Salesforce, but are providing some different level of analytics or intelligence or utility are uh, converging in terms of their product roadmaps. And the question is, why are they doing that? Because yeah. it could be. So I don't think it's a CS or churn issue. I mean, I, I my instinct is that their retention Maybe it's worse than it used to be, but I don't think they're doing any of these things because of churn. I think they're doing these things because of growth. I think it's mm-hmm. a total addressable market issue more than anything else. And I think that uh, all of those companies, to justify their multi, multi billion dollar valuations, you know, what I've always uh, thought. I think there's sort of two things that are happening on the first side of things is there's an argument that to justify the valuation at some point you either have to you have to confirm that there's additional budget coming out of effectively like the CIO or go to market department that still is probably managed by the CIO at some point in large enterprises that is uh, additional to Salesforce or additional to CRM, right? If, if, if we're going to say that Clary is worth 10 billion or whatever they were probably worth at their most recent round is probably a couple billion. And if outreach is worth a couple billion and gongs worth a couple billion, then ostensibly Either there's a there's, you know, adding all of those up, there's, you know, another, let's say, a hundred billion dollars of enterprise opportunity that is in addition to Salesforce's dominance uh, in the CRM space, or the enterprise value of these companies implies that they will replace Salesforce. It's sort of mm. one or the other, or replace the CRM if we're talking yeah. about mm-hmm. Salesforce and HubSpot and maybe a few other systems or platforms. So I don't think it's a CS issue as much as it's a it's a growth issue of and what I also think is that there seems to be somewhere around two hundred million in ARR. These companies seem to be hitting uh, a wall, uh, in terms of their ability to continue growth. And it's, you know, anywhere from like 125, 150 to 200, 225. But I haven't heard of any of these, I heard of all of these companies surging past a hundred million and yeah. in ARR, particularly yeah. gong and outreach. I heard a lot of these companies getting to 200. I heard then that growth has stalled or curtailed. I haven't heard of a single one of them getting past 300 yeah, uh, and, uh, on any of these on, on their momentum. So I think they're probably saying we have an install base. Uh, the next big tranche of customers is probably laggards in terms of adopters of new technology. And we're not going to be able to, you know, penetrate as well as we might have otherwise. And we need to find new products to sell to people and increase our poo for our existing customer base. So I don't really necessarily, that's my instinct. You know, if you're asking, I, I think, um, and I think, Meanwhile, uh, you know, to the point of like the departure of 600 CCOs, I think there's consolidation that's happening uh, at the same time. I think that there's a lot of point solutions that did not reach the scale that Clary, Gong or Outreach have reached. And those companies are getting to the point of, you know, the year of M&A, a catalyst and um, and uh, to Tango merging. I think there's consolidation happening because there's a lot of companies that are saying we actually don't even know have, you know, full confirmation that, that the way we've defined the category is big enough to pursue a multi-billion dollar opportunity. I think at the same time, there's consolidation in the C-suite actually for, I think there's probably a parallel between job title and C-suite function, uh, consolidation and consolidation of technology vendors and people that you're selling these products to. Because I was on the phone with the CRO of one of the companies that you actually just mentioned, I won't say who, uh, yesterday, Asad. And he was saying, you know, a year ago, we had a chief business officer, we had a chief customer officer, we had a chief revenue officer, we had a chief this and a chief that and a chief this and a chief that. And now we just have me, I'm president. Uh, president of all go to market and we've consolidated all of these chief titles into one. And I think that's probably related to the fact that maybe all of these things aren't categories and massive departments unto themselves. Maybe it's all just go to market. That 
I love hearing you talk, Sam. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, it's a nice way to start the day. So the chief business officer. What else do you want me to talk about? I can talk about anything you want. Know, just keep talking. I'll keep listening. Okay. You uh, look really the good. Chief You're business- very sexual. <laughs> The chief business officer point is interesting, Chris. He's tracking that as well. And it's drawn from 9,400 at the start of the year to 8,700. So I think you nailed it on what's happening from a roles perspective, that it's just everything is getting consolidated. AJ. Yeah. Can I just say one thing before we move to AJ? Uh, Chief business officer is the (laughs) friggin' most hilarious, most inane Aren't we all doing business? No, no, no. But that's the chief of the business. I thought we were all in the business. Well, how business. many? How many? No, chief no, no. Biz- Wait a second. How many chief business officers do you know that weren't co-founders? I feel like that's a kind of a co-founder esque title for someone. At what scale. does a chief business yeah, officer mean? What does that mean? I don't know. I'm just I'm a that. business person. I, I feel um, like it's in a in an e-commerce. Like that's where they put chief business officers. It's not in SaaS. Like that's not a SaaS role, is it? Yeah, we don't see. I've, I I didn't know there were ninety four hundred of them. Like, if you th- compare it, there are sixteen thousand CROs and there are ninety four hundred uh, CBOs. I I haven't seen a lot in SaaS as well, but it's a very strange role. It's just a strange title for a strange role. AJ, when a startup sees this, yeah. startups usually start off very resource constrained, and so they start by building this specific solution and kind of it's uh, it's expanding out from there when they look at this setup and they see that companies are trying to have one vendor solve many problems for them because they've realized that they uh, there's a lot of negative impact when you have 12 different technologies the context switching moving from one to the other paying all these different vendors, doing all these quarterly reviews and spending time on that with all these vendors. It's a waste of time. It's highly inefficient. I would be okay if the call recording software in this company is not A+, plus, just the way Gons is, but at least it's one and I'm okay with that. That's kind of scary for a startup that's trying to get started, right? They're like, how do we build a comprehensive solution? We're sort of resource constrained. What, what are your thoughts on that? a challenge that they're going to be thinking through your advice to a founder that's early stage that's wrestling with this. Yeah. If this is a question uh, for me, the beginning part of it, I'm going to piece it together for you, Asad, because it was a little bit choppy. I actually want to jump back to something that Sam (laughs) said um, about Tam. Uh, Tam is fascinating. 10 years ago, no one thought about TAM because it was always growing. It was always increasing. And we never, as founders of startups, had a TAM issue. We always thought about it's growing 30% or 25% year over year. And so us as founders never thought about this. And I think even at scale, when you're go-to-market, you didn't think about TAM uh, until you hit last year. And that's also the rise of vertical SaaS uh, coming up because I think that that's where a lot of investors look to other industries, other areas to understand like, oh, this is going to hit a cap. We, we're we figuring out what this cap looks like. And these point solutions are now, even though they are platforms, a gong, Clary, outreach, they hit a, they've hit a cap to, I think, what they can ultimately sell into. Um, Sam, you probably heard a little bit more of Austin's question. So I'm going to kick it over, over to you and then fill in the gaps and make uh, quips when <laughs> I can. <laughs> Well, this is a great episode. <laughs> Smooth sailing, guys. Smooth sailing. <laughs> High tech CEOs. <laughs> I said, what was your question? I forgot it. I don't even know. It was a question on the fly. What are we even doing here? Oh, yeah. Here was the question. The question is that if you're an early stage founder. Right. What's your advice to early stage founders, AJ? Yeah. Who's- Wait, here, AJ, can you hear us? Okay. You can't hear us. Uh, All right. I can. I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. I'm switching, switching. This is we're gonna lose half of our audience on this episode. Guys, just um, stay with <laughs> us. Stay with us. Don't <laughs> leave us. We just struggle with the I internet think, because I think we're the audience CEOs. I think I make up like seventy five percent of the audience. I'm like just to, just <laughs> to be clear. True. I heard yeah. I've actually received a lot of positive feedback about you, AJ. Which is surprising to me, given, given, <laughs> given that I know you reasonably well. Now, I don't have a lot of positive feedback about you, but other other people do. I can hear you, Sam. I can okay, hear you. Do the question. 
<laughs> he's frozen. He can't hear anything. I can, I can hear everything, everything you're saying. I hear everything you're saying. AJ, it is cold plunges. He's lost 10 pounds, folks. He's looking svelte. He's looking good, but he cannot hear anything. Uh, AJ, what is your – can you hear us? What is your advice to early-stage founders – who are worried it's it's related to the TAM comment you just made. They're building point solutions. They don't have the resources to provide a comprehensive full suite of call recording plus uh, revenue intelligence plus forecasting plus medic adoption and qualification. They don't have the resources to build a multi product platform. They only can provide one point solution, but they see all of this consolidation happening. They see that Clary Gong Outreach, all of these companies are moving, Zoom Info, all of these companies are moving in the same direction. So what is a founder to do if you're an early stage company? What do you advise? You're an advisor to so many companies. You're an early investor in SpaceX. You personally counseled Elon on a lot of the issues relating <laughs> to buying Twitter. You are the fifth all-in bestie. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. What do you advise these early stage founders to do? And he's frozen again, folks. He's frozen. All right. So here's all answer for How would I give some advice? I, don't I, know I can people. actually hear I you, but I'm missing the beginning part of the conversation. So I don't know if the question's <laughs> actually directed at me. So I didn't it know. It it. Run with it, AJ. It's your question. This whole conversation has been directed at you, my friend. <laughs> oh, uh, my God. Right, Asad, what would you do? What's the advice that you would give? I think it's really tricky because right now you can see the advantages of what they call this compound startup right or compound software company like the rippling model and rippling has just been such a spectacular company that most people would say you shouldn't build like that there was a lot of the zero the zero to one methodology that peter thiel would put forward like be very lean be very specific and then yeah, Parker Conrad came and said, there's another way to do this. It's capital intensive, it's broader, it's bigger, but it's a more robust value proposition. And I think companies really lean into that. So if you're a second time founder, I think it's very hard for a first time founder to get the funds to be able to do this. But if you're a second time founder and you're trying to see what is this? What are the opportunities in the market? I think very few people actually think about compound startups and building them, but there's an opportunity there. We've seen one company do it really well, and investors, I think, would back. Who was that? Who was the talking about Rippling? Rippling is, oh, Rippling. Rippling is just such a successful startup that's done exactly that. <laughs> I think if you are <laughs> if you are able to raise the, those type of funds for which you have to be a second time founder, I think that's the approach that's interesting. If you're a first time founder, um, you have to be more specific, but you have to really lock in and see where are the gaps in between the Venn diagram of these uh, companies and do more research. Like if you actually do the effort of trying to reach out to the junior and mid-level people in the uh, in the organizations that are in the space. So let's say go to market tech, you can get a read on what their product roadmap looks like. So you can see, am I building something that in a few months, they're just going to add as a feature. And I think you have to do that extra level of due diligence to see, have I found a gap that is a real gap? And then right. run with that. Asia, what do you think? I'm back. I have something to say. <laughs> I'm here. Let's to, go. To, but let's he wants go. to go back 30 minutes to yes. a different topic that was discussed in a different podcast. Did you say something about right. I was like Elon Musk's top like influencer or something when I was gone? Just, just answer the question, AJ. What do you have to say? Go, so, just go this, ahead. So, Asa, this compounding startup it has existed for a time. HomeAway. Do you all know the, the genesis of HomeAway? No, I don't even know no. who they are. Home away? You don't know who home away is? Sam stayed no. in a home away in Austin for like three months. I'm pretty confident of this. Is this true, Sam? <laughs> it was an Airbnb. But I oh, hear you. Whatever. Their first it's, Airbnb. So VRBO uh, is a is a home away brand. There's a lot of like they had. They started where they took a second time founder CEO, Austin Ventures said, "Here's fifty million dollars. Go buy four companies and, and roll them up and figure it out." And that's what he did. Um, and so that became a massive brand because of this compounding interest that you see. I don't think Rippling's done the same thing. Rippling, I think, is all homegrown workflow management, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I have heard they both I, I have 
I have heard from people that have left Rippling, there's a little bit of an S show inside because oh. of how they operate with, they sell 30 different SKUs. They have 360 different companies in the marketplace. Their reps get quota relief. Look, I am, we're Rippling customers. So I'm also like understand that there's some things around this. And I just went through the onboarding flow. Some of it is phenomenal like the Slack notifications, how you connect different things. And some of it is a little rough around the edges. You can definitely tell, but there's $600 million in revenue. And they've done that in like six years. How would you expect anything less than that? So that's my point. Also, by the way, I have a few things. I have a few gripes to say about 30 minutes ago. So I've got some stuff to say put on the table. <laughs> um, I do want to say this if it didn't get, if it didn't get, but the TAM conversation is a really important conversation that I think we're hearing more and more and more of. Not, uh, not because that, I don't think anything's broken necessarily, but I do think that investors, when they go to startups, even early stage startups, always hand wave the TAM conversation. Oh, it's growing 36% year over year. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Boom. You have tons of these companies hitting the top end of what is perceived TAM right now. That is has so many downstream effects for all of us, including myself. All three of us are in a go-to-market market. We just expect sales teams to grow. We are reevaluating. Mm. I'm reevaluating what is HubSpot's TAM? What is Rippling's TAM? What is Gusto's TAM? Those are my customers, and I'm looking at TAM completely differently today than I ever have. All right. So there. I said AJ, everything I could. Now I can just drop out of this episode and we're good to go. No, we want to <laughs> we wanna follow up with you. <laughs> what so when you say you're looking at TAM differently, does that mean that you're saying that your TAM is smaller? And I guess the question is, what? why is it that Salesforce can do billions in revenue, but all these other companies seem to stall out at 200 million? Where is the gap in kind of go-to-market or database technology around go-to-market that, that prohibits companies from getting to a billion in ARR? I would just think that there would be more, when we think about these super large companies, I guess we think about Zoom, who are the companies that are doing more than a billion in ARR? It's Zoom Info, it's uh, HubSpot, HubSpot, and it's Salesforce. Yeah. So Who I had, else? I and had this exact, con there? I had this exact conversation with someone in the know, um, around the HubSpot. So not giving anything away and thinking about their strategy and how it kind of differs from anything else out there. So you have system of record one, you have system of engagement and you have system of intelligence. I mean, for HubSpot, like that. that's a really interesting vertical strategy for all three of them where HubSpot thinks of Outreach, Gong, and SalesLoft, and all of these companies as point solutions. Not We've talked about them as platforms because they've pulled in conversational intelligence. But a company like HubSpot that went through CRM, they have the real data strategy, not this conversational intelligence BS. They have the real data strategy because that's where the system of record exists. Is anyone using Gong mm. for a system of record? Is anyone using oh, no. uh, Clary for a system of record? No, that's why their TAM is this massive thing because you have to use it to get work done. We've talked about it in the show where I've talked to other CROs who are going to rip out Gong from their uh, toolkit. Why? Because it's, it's a commodity right now. It's a commoditized yeah. product where you can get a, a Sybil.ai, which is what we're using, or Fathom, and you just have this like overlay on yeah. Zoom recordings and it works. It works well. Works well enough. All it's right. I love that distinction. So system of record, system of engagement, and system, system of, of data, which I would consider data. System of intelligence. Which which is has like the, the AI component. Very close to the okay. But system of record is really like the key differentiator, right? Yeah. Like if if you own the central data warehouse for any aspect of a company's workflow you have a much bigger opportunity than just being, for example, the system of engagement, which sits on top of the system of record and has to pipe data into that system. Yeah. Well, and you, if you think about quota path, if you think about quota path, we fit sit into that data aspect of it. So I look at this as like a connector of like, how can we connect and be a middleware inside some of these system of records to help the flow of information from one end to another? That's interesting. 
The other part of it that I think sometimes companies and founders make mistakes with is they assume that everyone outside of tech will feel the same way about their technology and how many pieces of technology they want as companies within tech feel, right? Like one, we have a lot of clients that are in oil and gas. They all use Salesforce. They don't even know who Gong is. They don't know Outreach. They've never heard of Clary and they don't care to use all those things. So I think there is a lot of difficulty in expanding out of tech and maybe financial services like those are two for verticals a lot of tech companies have success in but then to become a billion dollar company you have to sell into way more verticals and way more geographies and there's a lot of complexity in geographical expansion and there is just a lot of resistance in other verticals to buy all of these pieces of technology i was talking to the the coo or the chief strategy officer i'm not sure what his title is but he reports to the cro of zoom info and, uh, and he was saying exactly what you were just saying, Asad, which is that one of the key ways that you can continue your growth is if you have verticalized sales functions that are still selling your solution, but are tailoring it specifically to the vertical that you're going after. And I think that that motion is probably more complicated, more expensive, and more nuanced than most companies fully under, uh, estimate or budget for. In the, in the way that Salesforce has a completely, they're not autonomous, but their government services division, the, the, the group of people, which is I'm sure is thousands of people at Salesforce that sell into the federal government, they understand all of the nuances, how to get on the GSA schedules yeah. and how to make sure that they're in the procurement process in the right way and how to make sure everybody has security clearance. And they have dedicated product marketing, like dedicated product marketing is an understatement probably <laughs> for the level of customized marketing and sales go to market motions that are developed specifically for each vertical. And I think that might be something that some of these companies hit the wall on where they think that it's sort of this horizontal use case. And there also probably are a small number of revenue go to market executives that really have deep multi industry experience. Yeah. Here's how we built the healthcare vertical. Yeah. Here's how we built the government vertical. Here's how we built the financial services vertical. And I think that that skill set is probably is probably pretty expensive to uh, to find and to develop. Here's something yeah. that I find interesting. Everybody knows that Google's most powerful uh, 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 group within the org is engineering. Everybody knows an Apple, it's design. Very few people talk about how in Microsoft, the most powerful unit is product marketing. And in Salesforce also, product marketing is a very powerful unit. But in Microsoft, it is the most powerful unit. And Microsoft, you can see, they've mastered the art of the relationship. They really, from a relationship perspective, they have all the customers. Now it's a distribution thing. It's a product marketing problem. And if you look at how they've bundled things to get customers to lean into the things they're selling them, um, they, there's a lot to learn over there for other companies, but that's where the complexity is. So in, in, in startups, product marketing is an afterthought. In companies that have successfully expanded their time to these billion plus dollar uh, revenue streams, product marketing are the leaders. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And, and to your point, I think that there's this, I remember, and, and again, I love all of the people that I'm referring to, so I'm not calling anybody out, but I remember Gong doing their Super Bowl commercial. And I remember talking to Udi and to the team at Gong about it. And they were saying, well, how do you continue to grow TAM? And how do you continue to grow the market when uh, you've already reached a certain level, a certain status? And, you know, there's only so much, so many demand chain, demand gen channels I can invest in. There's so many, there's only so many paid acquisition channels I can invest in. And I'm just wondering, as we talk about it, whether that sort of misses the point that you keep going super broad yeah. and you're just like, how do I keep, where do I, where can I dump a hundred million dollars? Maybe I can dump it super broadly as opposed to maybe I need to spend $10 million per vertical yeah. to, and not just per vertical in terms of paid acquisition or going to a trade show, but developing the product marketing specifically for healthcare. How does Gong work for healthcare? How does Gong work for government services in a way that feels unobvious and unintuitive to me because if you're used to just extending marketing channels linearly and saying okay this is how we got to 100 million this is how we got to 200 million let me just keep extending my spend and look for deeper channels i can invest in it's no it's not about deeper channels it's about segmenting the market with precision and then really investing in being a presence in these industries in the way that salesforce has and i think that's where you know, the predecessors 
are probably like the big ERP companies, yeah. the big enterprise tech companies like Oracle, like SAP, like HP. Like if you didn't work at Oracle, Mark Benioff worked at Oracle. So he yeah. understood the playbook for how to do what Oracle did for Salesforce. Yes. Yes. If you didn't work at those huge companies, I wonder if you even have that inclination. Well, I didn't know till somewhat recently that product marketing was the most powerful unit in Microsoft. It literally blew my mind when I found out. But like, it was one of those things when you hear it, it makes all the sense in the world. But till you hear it, like you just didn't know it and didn't realize how important it was. Okay, I think Sam, you now have a flight to catch. Right, and I got to run after this word from our sponsors. Are you, are you, are you going to do a top line hotline with Kevin from Clary? Do it with Kevin from Clary. Yeah, we'll do it with Kevin. We'll do it with Clary. Kevin. We'll yeah, do we don't right. miss you, yeah. Sam, but Once have a good night. All of you. God bless all of you. By the way, remember, we've got uh, a, a top line channel that is available to any listeners. Uh, just ping us and we will market it. We're also going to do a LinkedIn Live top yeah. line hotline where we're also going to market our top line channel. And a lot of great and stuff coming up. We have yeah. potentially a live event coming up, but we will just tease that for right now. Yeah, we've got a lot of really exciting things going. Uh, and AJ. And Asad and I are also dancing uh, in a Broadway review of Showgirls. Actually. There we are. So we're That's the big one. That. That's Let's the do that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Bye. Talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. All right. Hey, CMOs and marketing VPs, that's Chief Marketing Officers, join Pavilion in New York City, the Big Apple, for the CMO Summit on April 18th. The CMO Summit. At CMO Summit, you'll connect with other amazing B2B marketing executives and learn from folks like Udi Lettergore from Gong, Latney Conant of Sixth Sense, Andrew Kale of Help Scout on topics like mastering the customer lifecycle, AI and marketing, and building an iconic brand. Register now at joinpavilion.com forward slash CMO Summit and use the code TOPLINE for an exclusive 15% discount on your ticket. That's joinpavilion.com forward slash CMO Summit and the code TOPLINE for an exclusive 15% discount on your ticket. I will be there and I look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be fantastic. Welcome back, listeners. Uh, as you know, this is a special episode because we're switching things up and doing things really differently. Um, so hope you enjoyed the first segment. The second segment, as we mentioned at the start, is with a really exciting guest. We have Kevin, who is the president of Clary, joining us. Everybody who listens to this episode probably already knows Clary. Uh, their revenue platform, Series F, 800 plus employees. Customers include organizations like Worddin, Topalti, and Cisco and Adobe. I love Topalti. They're a huge client of ours. So they're my favorite Clary customer. And Kevin is joining us on a really exciting day because they just announced Rev AI. So Kevin, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Asad, thank you for having me. AJ, thanks for having me as well. Yeah, no problem. Actually, Asad, really, the reason this is a special episode is because we kicked Sam out of this episode. So <laughs> that's that's the reality of the situation. <laughs> uh, Sam had to catch a flight. So it's going to be uh, special. Kevin, thanks for joining. Um, you know, Asad gave a little bit of a background. I think that the something that we've been spending a lot of time talking about, uh, especially this year, is just basically a retro of go to market of 2023. And I know you've spent, uh, you've had some time in the sales seat in over your sure. career and different all the way back to Siebel systems, which uh, maybe a lot of our listeners are Gen Z and probably like, what is Siebel systems? <laughs> so, but I would love, I guess, the kick off of you to describe go to market teams in 2023 and how is that similar or different than what you've seen in your previous years? Yeah, you know, th this was definitely, this year and maybe part of the last, so let's call it like the last 18 months um, or six quarters, you know, things have changed for sure, right? The macro headwinds have made selling tougher. The biggest change that go-to-market teams have had to adjust to is for the majority of us that are venture backed, we've really been focused on growth, right? And it's it's been pulling all levels levers of growth from top of funnel to how you execute, to how you take care of your customers and how you renew. And the way we've operated has had to change. Most of us that are venture backed have to really think about not just growth, but growth and efficiency. So different metrics have become more important than in the past, where in the past it was hire fast, ramp fast, um, execute at all levels. And, and really you've now had to think about how do you find efficiency in your go-to market? Um, as well as, you know, how do you handle different kinds of customer challenges? How do you 
handle consolidating markets? How do you handle a lot of companies moving to more platform play? Um, and that's changed how we think about the entire go-to-market. You know, it's, it, it is interesting. And like I, we've talked about this as well, our KPIs and what we're focused on. One of the things we mentioned earlier in this episode was TAM and how TAM has changed a lot. I think for a lot of us, when we're as a venture back company, when we have the ser seed series A deck up there, like TAM's growing 36% year over year, and it's something we're just going to crush. And for a lot of organizations, Clary included, I think Gong and Outreacher in this, as they've sold into tech and venture back companies, they've had to really rethink their strategy horizontal. And I know Clary has done a lot of work in this area, not just selling into tech. Um, and I'm, I'm gu guessing that happened before 2023, but maybe accelerated in 2023. Was that something that changed at all? Or was I like, oh, we yeah, obviously, you know, you're, you're looking for growth and really it's what we call SAM expansion, right? How do we expand our serviceable addressable market beyond what has traditionally been tech and right? Tech's kind of a crowded space where you've got a lot of solutions in it. The biggest needle mover for us and quite honestly, any of our competitors is the digital maturity of selling outside of tech. Mm. Um, without giving my competitors too much you know, good information <laughs> on our go-to-market, um, we have found success in verticals that look and smell a lot like tech do, where B2B sales, B2B enterprise sales, where rigor um, is important. So areas like med device, financial services, um, different types of manufacturing, service provider, telco, we've seen success and we've seen them really start to adopt a lot of what tech has done. The other areas where we've seen expansions, we've, do, we've done um, acquisitions. Uh, mm -hmm. A company called Groove was the latest and they're in the sales engagement space. Um, they had already sort of broken out of tech and found success in other verticals. And, you know, it's funny when I see some of the wins and renewals come in, they're, they're, they're in verticals way outside of, of tech. And it's really cool to see um, some of those glass manufacturers and window companies and, wow. and, 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 and gambling places. So we, we see, um, you know, we're seeing the, the, the SAM start to expand. So th this is really interesting because for a while, if you look at this go-to-market technology ecosystem as a whole, you had companies solving different types of problems. You had the Gons and the Outreaches and you had Clary. And as, as AJ mentioned, as you said as well, over the last couple of years, but especially in the last 12 or so months, we've noticed that everybody has decided that they need to become provide more value. They need to provide more value to their customers for which they need to solve more problems for their customers, broaden the solutions out, become more platform, more like platform. You guys were really uh, well suited for that because of your original starting point. I think it's much harder for an outreach to be like, let us become your system of record, than Clary from their starting off point to say, let us become your system of record. So I think, A, there's a lesson in there as to pick the right starting off point if you are trying to become a platform down the line. But now a lot of collaborators have become competitors and the landscape looks really different. Part of this is, as you guys said, this uh, addressable market that we can sell into. Um, we are trying to expand that out. The challenge with that is that if you think of companies in manufacturing and supply chain, et cetera, when people originally do their time analysis, they assume that these buyers buy the same way, that they're going to be just as excited about call recording as a tech company was excited about call recording. It's just really, really different. And so can you click into the downstream effects from an execution perspective? Like as you guys have broadened who you sell into, what have been some of the challenges you've had to address internally to be able to do that really well? A, from a moving from a solution selling to a, so moving from a point solution sale to more of a platform sale and B, in selling to people in all these different verticals that have different personalities, different needs, different wants, different levels of awareness of all of this stuff. How has that been? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, a lot of questions within that yeah. question. So maybe we'll jump. <laughs> you we'll jump right. Do think, you have you have your whole go to market framework? You're just going to show <laughs> like. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my, uh, turn my screen. Uh, you know, so when you think about all these companies, right, public, private, etc., essentially their leaders and their board all, all have the same problem, right? Which is, are we going to meet, beat, or miss on revenue? 
the end of the day, that's what they all care about, right? As they report to Wall Street or they report to their investors or, or whoever they're, they're backed. And so they all have the same challenges that tech companies have. Now, how they run their revenue processes to achieve that is different and evolving. And so at Clary, we've always thought about revenue as a process. And it's made up of all these moments that happen throughout the organization at all levels, rep level, manager level, executive, supporting cast, so all revenue critical employees. And each of those moments is really part of a cadence and a cadence that has to be done and run well to achieve those results. And so what we found you know, in, in our time in tech, right, is tech, tech had a lot of rigor in how it ran its revenue cadences because it was really about growth and taking advantage of opportunity as quickly as it could because of changing technologies in the background. Well, by the way, life sciences is very similar, right? You got a new mm. technology, you got to take it to market fast and you got to you know, beat before something becomes generic. And so we see those patterns you know, of, of tech now evolving in other industries. Um, what's happened in this space, especially in tech, is there's been all, this new, all these new solutions that have come to market to help salespeople be more effective. And in the good times, companies bought everything. everything. And so you'd find that they'd have two and three solutions to manage just little one-off like point um, problems. Yeah. And what's really started to happen is companies want to deal with one partner and they want a platform. And, and so I think I'm getting to the next part of your question here. And, and what we think we did really well at Clary is we solved the hard thing first, which was the creation of the revenue database. So it's a in-memory, real-time, time series based um, database with a bi-directional real-time integration into the CRMs and it's bringing that data plus everything else that's happening around you in the enterprise together and it's snapshotting it. That snapshotting allows us to use AI and machine learning to help the human essentially um, you know, predict where, where they're going um, with the revenue. And that's what allowed us to now start to do acquisitions of things that have kind of become somewhat commoditized. Yeah. Call recording, you know, sales engagement um, and others. And so the category of what has traditionally been revenue intelligence, you know, and, and a bunch of other things is coming together. And we feel like we're well positioned to be that platform for our customers. Why? Our CROs want one place to have command and control over their business. And our reps, who are the CEOs or owners of their franchise, want one place where they can drive their business and be accountable for their business. And so th those things, you know, and the macroeconomic environment are changing it. And I think that the last thing that's changing it is if you really want to apply AI and having one platform and one curated data set to apply it against makes a lot more sense than all this 100%. disconnected separate things. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting, Kevin, because you, you all, the way I think about it is you're really close to that close of the deal the revenue. And so the conversational right. intelligence is further away. So the closer you are, the closer to the deal, like the, the more urgent and more important you are for the CRO. I always think of Clary as being, has done a really great job of selling to the CRO. Um, you, I, you actually know, uh, Kevin McEwen, our CRO, yeah. uh, at Trendkite, my previous company. Um, and he was always a big Clary follower, uh, and, and customer advocate. And a lot of it was being, having those CROs. At, but you get a lot of really interesting data from that. We're on the other side of it with sales compensation, but similar, see yep. it similarly, where it's like, that's the really hard problem to solve first. I don't think Clary is, and I'm not going to hold it that you are Spiff customers against you, by the way. So it's okay. <laughs> Spiff is going <laughs> to have right. some burn after this. Well, they're Salesforce <laughs> now, so it doesn't matter. They're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, we actually set this whole thing up so I could uh, yes, call that out. <laughs> You're get a purchase order off of He's now on the wrong side of things. <laughs> no, no, it's exactly, exactly right. It's true. But like, it's really hard to solve commission. And I don't believe like a Clary or Gong or a HubSpot or Salesforce, Salesforce clearly, none of these companies are gonna go solve that problem because it's, it's so challenging. Forecasting is exactly, you have so many different data points in different ways that fields and collection of data and how they interact with each other. It's very, very, very complicated. So I agree AJ, with you on that solving problem. AJ, question for you actually. So if let's put, your, put yourself in the seat of one of those companies that did 
um, call recording or you know the spray and pray tech those type of organizations the the larger ones right without naming them for the sake of the question what would you be doing if you're within the organization because they seem to be in a really tough spot right they they have a lot of headwinds right now and they need to broaden out their solution they need to become one it, it, what kevin said is cfos and cro's want one thing maybe two things they don't want 10 things made sense right how would they fight to become this one thing from their starting off point like what's the what would you do if you were in those organizations I mean, I think you have to look to, so for, first off, I 100% agree where those organizations that won't be named had down quarters. I Look, we're not going to name Clary's quarters. revenue. We aren't going to name Clary's revenue. I don't think Clary had a down quarter. Uh, this is my position on it. Not From what we've heard, there was growth. <laughs> there was growth. So I would look at it as the, the look at Apollo. Apollo is a great example of, of a Zoom info where they made it PLG. They made it, they, they realized that data was commoditized and they went down to the bottom um, to, to, to really like. Yeah, but they had 60% uh, retention when they raised their round. So it wasn't necessarily. But great. because they're selling to SMBs in mid market and they raised a $100 million round though. So like you see that happening is a different point of view than a zoom info selling at the enterprise. And so I, I would look at it as like a differentiator where conversational intelligence is commoditized. It truly is. I, I use a tool that is connected to zoom. I don't use gong. Um, we were a chorus customer or we're, we're a zoom info customer, but only because we had to be because we weren't getting value out of zoom info. So like, that's something that we're seeing happen in that part of it where what I think Kevin is saying is like, yeah, we've, we started at the hard thing first and are bringing the data in because we see it somewhat similarly. Kevin, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but no, that I feels mean, you, like. You, you got it, right? I mean, it's, it's we, we solved the really hard thing first and it took us, you yeah. know, years to build it with, with some of the greatest companies on earth, right? We had to learn how these companies run revenue. And in, in the process of it, the way companies, manage revenue change, right? Before it was opportunity-based, right? Now it's count-based. Now it's things like consumption. So having a platform that's flexible to actually handle these different business models became really important too. And so by, by starting with the heart of it, now anything we want to add and extend the use cases or workflows for driving, retaining, you know, renewing revenue, we can do. Um, and so I, 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 Love the, the path that Clary took. Yeah, we were talking about this in the first segment that because of this pressure that we see in the ecosystem now where CFOs and essentially any executive, they, they've understood the negative implications of technology bloat that, oh my God, I had 15 different solutions in my go to market team. Like the context switching is, is, is really inefficient. So I want this one thing, maybe two things. And so one of the things we were talking about is its impact for a startup. Like how should you think about starting a business where you've got these broader platforms buyers only want to buy one or two or three things. So you can't just have a small point solution. You have to solve a really valuable problem. How do you pick the right problem to solve? And I think you kind of landed on it that pick the hardest problem to solve and pick a problem from which it made sense for you to become a platform because it might just not make sense for a sales engagement tool to say to a CRO, let us be your system of truth. Yeah. But it made a lot of sense for Clary to have that conversation. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, you know, when, I, when our founders started the company, Andy Byrne, Ben Catrung, and, um, you know, over 10 years ago, they were really solving for a specific intersection of pain, rep, manager, and sales operations, yeah. right? We used to call it the golden triangle. And that, that really led us, right, to start to develop a way for that cohort to communicate around revenue and drive it. And, and, our, and our platform grew from there. That's fascinating. That was the that was the surprising thing I heard when listening to a recent podcast with Andy was that it was a rep first. Yeah, uh, Salesforce started out the same way. Um, Salesforce but that, started out rep first. Yeah, Salesforce wow. started out rep first. Actually, Kevin can keep me honest on this. He would know. <laughs> he would know for sure. Well, I, we, all, we honestly all did. And if if you guys let me rewind the tape, um, please. What to nineteen ninety nine when I joined Siebel, you know there was always the. the you know, and people started before that, there was always the dream of like what CRM was going to do, right? It was, was going to make us more productive. It was going to make us better sellers. It was going to help companies drive revenue. But at the end of the day, they were only as good as the data that went into it 
And for yeah. the most part, reps hated to put anything into, into the CRM. It was pain in the butt. And it really nothing changed that just went to the cloud. And so this is where Clary really started to fill its you know, initial value prop was it made life so much easier because it was intuitive. It auto captured things. It took the basic stuff off the table. But more importantly, it actually gave something back to the rep that made them a more strategic seller and allowed them to do their job better. Yeah. I didn't learn my lesson because I started rep first at Quota Path. So we, <laughs> we went that and had, the, had a very, very similar journey. Um, but still, I think both for the organizations, it's all about bringing visibility and clarity to the rep. And then obviously for you all, it's that workflow in terms of the man clarity around the management uh, team and, and having, um, having better visibility over, over the overall team, which honestly makes sense to go enterprise at that time, because then it's just very complicated to have that visibility. AJ, at um, what point well. did you guys stop being rep first? Like, when did you make that decision? Uh, 20, one, we did a lot of like PLG yeah. sharing of comp plans, mm. 21 into 22, like Spiff and Captivate had clearly gone up market and we stayed RevOps then until 22 and then did much more on the compliance side, ASC 606 and Ledger and RevRack um, connecting yeah. into FPNA tools in 22 into 23. And today are like rep manager, Ops, RevOps, and finance. And now you don't buying, consider finance. Quota Path as PLG, right? No, product led motions, free trial, uh, uh, transparent pricing. Um, we have, we, I mean, our trials have tripled uh, the last two quarters, quarter over quarter. Interesting. Uh, so, and we have a pretty high conversion rate on those. Um, but it's it's really so that people can like see the the thing before it's a buying it's like how people buy today um but we're still smb to mid-market okay. right? so we haven't moved to enterprise that's still the segments that you're mostly focused on yeah ricp for that for that reason because if you're enterprise like you 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 want to have that level of white glove treatment you yeah. have to have the understanding especially with integrations i think kevin you probably know this better than most integrations are a tricky 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 beast and most of our buyers, similar to yours, are not as sophisticated as we would like them to be yeah. in understanding how all of these worlds connect. And so we've, our companies, and you will probably have had multiple iterations of this, of what does that centralization of integrations look like on the ETL side? Like, I, I think you all have actually had product launches around this. Yes, uh, it's previously. very different, right? In, in the enterprise, you have, you've got more legacy systems, you've got, new, you've got new platforms, you've got a lot of integration points. In you know younger companies, you have more you know new you have newer right easier things to integrate to different levels of complexity, and so we see we see very different between what we would consider uh, commercial, which is really mid market commercial and SMB, and then what we see in enterprise. Yeah, and, and the level of customization you see in their CRM systems in the enterprise is is out of control. So not I mean multiple Salesforce yeah. instances uh, yeah, you really? have. You have a lot, of, yeah. We yeah. you have PEs that do the roll up, and it's just oh. like Trendkite. Trendkite was one of them. We had six Salesforce instances <laughs> going into Cision. Like we, Cision we had, had six with, with seventeen major uh, right. Salesforce instances. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah, that's it's, wild. It's, yeah, but then you then you have to do a lot of the other like Nets. You're like, well, how does Net Suite or Stripe data connect into this? And so like. You're adding a lot of complexity to this that at the enterprise works. Down market is where it's been challenged. And I would still say a challenge that we're still figuring out. Although we have a handful of customers today that are now Clary customers. Uh, so I do get the sense that Clary's had some down market uh, pushes without giving, I don't think that that's, I'm not giving anything away by just saying our we have customer overlap. But um, <laughs> it seems like there's some level of like, more sophistication that you all are seeing maybe down market that you probably didn't see previously. It would also just be the acquisitions, right? How do you, yeah, so how do you get your team ready for this stuff, uh, Kevin, right? Like you have your team selling into new verticals, selling more robust yeah. solutions. How do you, it's so hard, right? Like sales is hard and some salespeople are really good at selling things that are a little that are more specific and size of customer vertical. How do you prepare yourself to do all of this? Like when you decide yeah. to become a more robust solution? 
It's, 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 a, it's as big an undertaking as we entered this fiscal year. So we've now done three acquisitions and we've broadened our technology stack um, and the use cases that we support. And so think of it as going from point solution um, to multiple solutions to platform. And when you go to platform, you introduce more than just those solutions you introduce to what AJ was just describing, integrations and workflows that may uh, start or end or at some point go into other parts of an organization and other systems, right? And so platform really starts to change things. Our North Star, as we sold, has always been understanding a customer's strategic initiatives and how Clary can help operationalize those through all the revenue mm -hmm. workflows. So we, we, we always had a really good starting point. Now it's been, you know, taking the acquisitions and changing the conversation so that our, you know, reps, customer success team, et cetera, yeah. can really talk about what a platform means. And when you do acquisitions, you know, Clary's traditional buyer has always been the CRO, but mm. for sales engagement and conversational intelligence, that might've been enablement or head of SDR, head of demand gen. And so, you know, those types of buyers ask different questions, right? They might want to do a feature function compare. They might want to get more technical. They may spend more time on security. And so the acquired sellers, really had to learn how to sell to the CRO and the existing sellers had to learn how to handle those situations in the sales cycles. Um, and so you start to look at your go-to-market. Do I have everybody do everything? Do I have any, do I, do I think yeah. about specialization? Do, how do I equip my solution engineers to be able to demo across this? Um, for us, a couple of good things. We ran all the solutions we acquired before we acquired them. So our sellers actually mm. knew how to use them. Mm. So um, you were a Groove good. customer before you bought Groove. We, so, you know, you've mentioned a lot of competitors. I'm not going to mention their names, but we moved off of those things. Yeah. We trialed the things we bought and then we bought them. Um, smart. That's smart. Andy, Andy does name the competitors, by the way, directly in his podcast, <laughs> Kevin, just so you know. I know Kevin is kind. He Kevin said it directly. Kind of but Kevin is kind because he knows they're really struggling. So he's like, well, let, me, let me take it easy on you. Yeah, I'm proud of what we have and I'm proud of what we do. And I'm not going to discredit what other people have built. And I've used those things and, and they're good solutions. Uh, I like our position. Yeah. Um, but when you think about the sales reps, right? So we've asking them to do more. Right with more with more solutions, more land, they have more ways to land. So, so think about it. You've got to be able to to understand and deliver a full platform. You need to now figure out how to navigate this the beginning of where you're going to land because you might, you know, you might land with sales engagement or you might land with conversational intelligence and then lead to revenue operations or vice versa. And so, there's more ways to navigate. Um, so we took the teams through a big enablement push this year. Um, the other thing that's interesting and in, in while this is happening is the categories that have been sales tech are coming together into one, right? And so we've been very deliberate on how we talk and what our language is. And so we've now had to help our reps adopt mm. this level of language. And AJ, you probably hear some same things from me that you heard from Andy. Um, but it, it's important. Well, I, that was one thing I was going to ask was that I heard revenue collaboration used multiple times. Is that the category or is there a different name that you all I, I are using right now? I, I don't want to put, you know, words in, but I do want to, but we'll see where they come out with it. Um, <laughs> hearing a lot of revenue collaboration, um, you, you know, we, we use the term revenue collaboration and governance, you know, rev CG yeah. to sort of create our own definition until one actually emerges. But um, we like that because one, there is this to drive, and, and achieve your go-to-market, you have to have all your revenue critical employees collaborating around it together. And then two, the leaders actually need to know that it's being followed and deployed. And so that's where this sort of governance idea comes in, right? Is, okay, how do you know that it's actually working? Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you deploy it out there? And so that's, that's where we came up with RevCG. Yeah. So all I'm really hearing is that you're moving off of Spiff and that you're going to check out Quota Path on, <laughs> on this whole conversation. I'm just it's kidding. So Again, not <laughs> It's so interesting what you're saying, because there are a lot of times where companies feel that it's almost a, a problem too hard to solve, that the team that was set up to be successful selling this thing this way, 
will just not be able to figure this out. And yeah. obviously, I'm sure when you guys did it, there's some people that couldn't adjust yeah. or didn't want to adjust, right? But I like hearing the the belief in the fact that we can enable them to do this. This is a very solvable problem. We have the data. We know what to do. Yeah. We can get them comfortable with a more robust, a different type of conversation. Yeah. That's really cool to hear. I think the core competency of the sellers we hire is still the same, right? They got to be highly curious. They got to have an acceleration mindset. Um, it, you know, and, and the other thing that they're still missionary, right? We are still trying to get to the head of revenue and say, there's a better way to run your business and there's a better way to live your life. Um, and so we, we've done really well at hiring people that are evangelists for our product. Um, so, so that hasn't changed. It's just what we're asking them to do has changed. Yeah. Um, I've had to do bigger lifts of reps in the past, like going from on-prem to cloud. That was a big move that, must um, have been that I had to do in my past because you had a different, older way of selling. You were thinking about hardware yeah. and databases and big system integration. Um, you know, not, now, you know, when you went to cloud, it was very different. Is the big shift or is one of the big differences that if a team is full of mercenaries, they might be very effective at selling this thing that you were originally selling, but when this phase shift happens, they just don't want to, and it's too hard, whereas the missionary person can actually, they, they the mission stays the same, what we're doing changes, so they lean into the new thing a lot better. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, the mission hasn't changed, right? It's, it's just, we've brought more workflows yeah. together in one platform. That's how it sounds. Um, that have enabled all levels of the revenue hierarchy to do their job. Yeah. It's Kevin, one thing that's come up in our uh, just general the past year that we've talked a lot about is uh, partnerships and ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I know go to market has obviously, as we've talked about lots of different players, how does Clary think about partnerships? And like, what is from a growth standpoint? What does that mean yeah. to you? So there's different categories of, of partnerships. And so um, the, I'll start with one, which, you know, think about the, the system integrators, right? Those who have practices built up around major technologies like Salesforce. Um, and they do, they drive a lot of work there. They also have transformation practices that think about go-to-market transformation. Um, the nice thing is we, we actually tick both those boxes because we are the platform, you know, if you're doing a go-to-market transformation and you want to drive your process, you can do that in Clary. And because we're going to drive processes and create change, they're going to actually create change in some of those supporting selling systems, CRM systems. So, you know, for a, a Deloitte or a Centro, whoever, we, we actually, you know, bring together practices and, and we, we provide um, something you know, almost to be the North Star for what they're going to do with that customer, um, which is why, you know, we're, we're working on um, continuing to refine and, and make our revenue cadences methodologies more robust. So um, that would be one big area of uh, focus for us. And the second is, you know, all the other solutions that exist out there, right, around the revenue funnel, where that data coming together is super important around the buyer's journey, the continuous customer journey, so that your, your teams have everything they need to figure, be it a customer sol success solution or, um, you know, a attribution solution or, you know, any of those um, other things, being able to communicate with them, plus where customers are storing data um, or mm -hmm. accessing ERP data, right? So the integrations become more important when your platform. Kevin, the point around systems integrators is really interesting, which is whenever you talk about partnerships to somebody in the startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. all you hear about is like cross-selling and referrals and like that type mm -hmm. of stuff. Whereas like, I think what people don't realize is the world runs on partnerships, but it's these, you know, it's Microsoft and it's Accenture and there's so much to learn and um, strategy. So much yeah, strategy, strategy, right? Strategy. There's so, such elegance with which they do it. Um, so can you, maybe as we come, we can keep talking to you for hours, but uh, to be conscious of your time, maybe where we end it is, can you tell us when a company is ready to think about system integrated type of partnerships? Because if you're too small, they don't care, right? So what's yeah. the point at which you start strategizing about it, start having conversations, how much revenue, what scale, et cetera? Yeah, that's such a great conversation. And yeah, they're not going to pay attention to a startup unless there's significant um, opportunity to build a practice around it or there's opportunity to accelerate a practice. 
Um, we, you know, we went through these debates at Clary for a long time on when, and it was interesting. We actually started to hear from them. They were saying, God, you're in all of our customers and, mm-hmm. and you're, you're selling to the head person in these accounts that we want to talk to. What, what are you guys doing? And so they started to ask us for how do we partner? How do we do more together? Um, and, you know, when you're a SaaS solution like Clary, that the, 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 the implementation work isn't necessarily what's most attractive. It's the being the, the foundation, the methodology, the platform for the the change practices that go. That's to a really good point. Yeah. So we, we had to find something that was um, g- going to drive something that was top of agenda for them. And obviously they all have, they're all attacking the digital transformations offices that yeah. are happening, you know, in, in all these companies. Such a good point around the, the implementation revenue is pretty decent margin revenue and is, is billions yeah. of dollars, let's say, for its censure. A SaaS company might not provide that, but then there's this other entry point. Um, what a great point to end it on. Um, Kevin, what we usually do at the end of this is shout outs. And so, AJ, why don't you kick us off and then <laughs> Kevin, then I'll end it up. Yeah. Uh, sure. I am in Boston. This is uh, I'm in an office right now, and I am doing a lot of work with HubSpot tomorrow. So I want to shout out our uh, partnership leader, uh, Kelly Servin, who is fantastic and has been able to help set up a, a ton of different things. But uh, we're also going to a wrestling match tonight with <laughs> a few HubSpot partner leaders and Graham Collins. I have never been to a wrestling match That's before in my life. So... Uh, shout out to Graham, I guess, for for setting that up and going <laughs> with a few HubSpotters, which will be interesting. And then I'll be in the HubSpot office tomorrow. We're hosting a happy hour for HubSpot uh, employees and and a dinner tomorrow night. So thank you, Kelly, for setting up and getting the wheels in motion for all of That's this. Very cool. Good luck at your wrestling match. Yeah, uh-huh. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin. All right. Can I can I have two shout outs? You can have three. You can have two. <laughs> you can have three. No, you can't well, have three. Guess, you can have okay, two. two. <laughs> we'll settle we're on We're talking two. about where we are. So I'm, I'm in Park City, Utah. I'm looking out my window. We actually got some snow um, this late in the season. So that's great. It's been a good season. <laughs> um, yeah, first shout out I actually want to give, since we talked a lot about sellers today, I'm so proud of the, the sales organization at Clary. We have the best people. And and I love to hear from our customers when they go, you know, when they become a customer, go, hey, I want to hire your sales rep. They're remarkable. That's it. That's, I've ever that's been awesome. around. So one, that's a shout out. Two, you mentioned the beginning of this. We actually yes. announced Revenue AI today. Um, so super proud of it. What is Revenue AI? It's basically bringing all the different flavors of AI together across the revenue workflows. We think about it as three, predictive, descriptive, and generative, right? Predictive being all the things you've known Clary for for a long time. Predicting, are you going to meet beat or miss on revenue across all parts of revenue? Um, descriptive, like basically transcribing a call and then generative, what do you do with that data? How do you respond to it? Um, and so those key elements of AI are pervasive across Clary and we had our announcement today. So I'm so excited about that. It's really fun to see AI becoming practical now, right? Like it was all theoretical last year and now it's like, let's see how it actually makes us a lot better. We didn't get to chat about this, but one of the things on our docket was the Klarna AI um, service chatbot and its impact. So it's just such a fascinating time. Um, I'll end it for us. So I I want to highlight somebody. I don't know if it's, I, may, I guess it's a shout out. So there's a physicist in England. Um, that I find really interesting. His name is Brian Potts, and he's unique because he's a chart-topping musician and he's a very well-respected physicist. He received the Order of the British Empire. He received the Hawking Fellowship. And he said something that blew my mind, but also made me feel very relaxed and calm and chill. And so I thought others would like it as well. So here's what he said. In the piece of the universe that we can see, there are two trillion galaxies. Each galaxy is, let's say, the size of the Milky Way, give and take, Right. How big is the Milky Way? There's 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. It takes light 100,000 years to travel from one point of a galaxy to the other. And there's 2 trillion of these galaxies. Those 2 trillion galaxies might be a fraction of what is actually out there. So if you're trying to imagine this, don't. We can't. Like You can't fathom what this is. But it's really calming. It's really calming when you are so stressed about this little thing to put it all into context. So it helped me. I hope it helps everyone. Um, and with that, that's the show. Kevin, thank you for joining us. This was one of our favorite thank conversations. You, it was so good. Um, and we hope to have you back.
I really appreciate the opportunity. Great. I, we could talk all day, I think, guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. For sure. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. You bet. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Saad. This episode was brought to you by the book Ecosystem Led Growth, a new book by Crossbeam CEO Bob Moore. Pre order your copy at elgbook.com. That's elgbook.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Topline. To learn more about the trends, news, and developments impacting the world of B2B SaaS, head to joinpavilion.com, where more than 10,000 of the world's top go to market leaders go to achieve and unlock their full professional potential.